Today we're blessed to hear from Rick Stratford, who is the who is a partner at Peterson Partners. Peterson Partners is a private equity firm. They have over four hundred million dollars uh, under their management. Some of the, the companies that they've invested in include uh, Making Memories, a scrapbooking magazine, JetBlue Airlines, and the new Azul Airlines that David Norman founded, Jetscape, which is an airline leasing company, and Winter Farms. Rick previously worked for Hewlett Packer and Arthur Anderson before joining Peterson Partners. He holds an MBA from Wharton and a Master's of Accountancy from BYU. He's married to Jody and together they have five children. He sits on the boards of Apex Alarm, uh, Brandrum, True North, AR, True North AR, Winter Farms, US Lines, and Chexa. Some of his investors include Mitt Romney, Meg, Meg Whitman, who is the former CEO of eBay, uh, CEO of Toys R Us, and David Norman, the, the former founder of JetBlue Airlines. At a minimum one million dollar investment level, so any of you that qualify are welcome to speak with them. Thank you. Uh, is a small token of gratitude for the Center for Entrepreneurship for taking the time. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It's nice to get the gift before the lecture. You don't know what you're getting for. <laughs> thank you. That's very nice. Warm introduction. All right, to get started, I just want to get a sense of how many of you are interested in starting your own business, buying a business by show of hands? So quite a few. Very good. It's great to see that. Um, well, great. Well, today I want to focus a little bit on harvest, exiting your business, and, and valuation. But before I do that, I'm a, I'm a big sports fan, and the favorite, my favorite event of the entire year is March Madness. For those of you that aren't into basketball, it's a, it's a tournament played by the collegiate teams. They pick the top 64 teams. I guess it's 65 because there's one playing game. At the end of the day, they have what's called March Madness. You fill out your brackets. You determine who's going to be the, the, final, the final winner. Well, given what's going on in the credit markets today, in fact, I saw the Dow was down another 500 points. I mean, you guys, this is, this is a once-in-a-lifetime event that's gone on these last few weeks. So I came up, we have our own, what we call September Madness. Um, I'll get this thing working here. Here we go. September Madness, my own brackets here of all the banks going down. You know, we, we've got Goldman Sachs and Berkshire Hathaway, you know, Wachovia and Citigroup. Citigroup won, although uh, now it's in the courts. I guess Wells Fargo's trying to bid on, on that one as well. You know, Merrill Lynch had a buy, but then they got bought out by Bank of America. You know, we have um, AIG went down. Uh, U.S. Federal Reserve took, took that over. We got Fannie and Freddie went down with the Federal Home Finance uh, uh, Corporation. This was actually, it's even old. I mean, it changes daily, so it's hard to update my brackets. But, you know, last week, the bailout fund in U.S. Congress, the Congress won because they turned it down. Now they accepted it, but it's still not enough. As you know, the markets aren't, haven't reacted too favorably. Uh, Barack versus John McCain, we'll see. That's to be determined in a few weeks here. Uh, <laughs> You know, Washington Mutual just went down. J.P. Morgan Chase took over theirs. Uh, you know, we have it internationally as well. Lloyd's of London took over HBOS. We got the Queen of England taking over Northern Rock. So anyway, I got my own September Madness brackets. I mean, this is really an unprecedented time. It's just, it's just amazing what's going on. But I think it's relevant because for those of you that are starting businesses or buying a business, sooner or later, you're going to want to sell the business, right? At some point, you're going to have to have liquidity or want liquidity. But I think a lot of you probably don't think about that as you're developing your plans, but I think it's important. So again, I'm going to focus on when it's time to sell, the harvesting, and then some valuation metrics of what we look at on my side of the table. Again, I make investments. We've made investments in probably 70 different companies since I've been with the firm since 99. We've had a lot of different companies we've grown, and some we've sold, some we still own, and kind of gone through the whole process. So to start off with a harvest, I think it's important anytime you go into business to first think you know, again, the punchline, start with the end in mind. What, what sort of business are you trying to create? I mean, it's great to be passionate about something, and all entrepreneurs are, but it's nice to be passionate about something that actually makes money. Now, as an entrepreneur, that doesn't mean you're going to necessarily might be successful on your first try. It might take quite a few tries, and, but at the end of the day, I think you need to spend some time on, your, on what's your exit plan before you even start the beginning. What's, what, what is the end plan going to be? I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs that are stuck in businesses they can never sell. It's a great business, but at the end of the day, only unless you're running and operating and whatever cash flow it throws off every year, you're stuck in that business. No one wants to buy it. Either it's not growing enough, the margins aren't good enough, the market's not big enough. There might be a lot of reasons that you're stuck with this business for life and your entire net worth 
is tied up in this business, but you can't get it out. You can't get the value out. So I think it's always important when you're on the exit is first have the end in mind what you should, what you should be doing um, or what you can do going forward. Um, items to consider. So as you're considering to sell your business or having a liquidity event and exit, there's a lot of different things to look at, but here's a few to consider. One is, can someone help me grow this faster than I can alone? Sometimes you have a syndrome as entrepreneurs that you're so creative and, and you develop businesses and you think, I can do this better than anyone else. And that is probably true. But there are certain stages of the company that maybe you aren't the best person for the business. That maybe it's better for someone to take it from that $20 million stage to the $100 million, or maybe from $100 million to a billion in sales or whatever the case may be. You maybe, you know, all of us have a certain skill sets. None of us have it all. None of us have the whole package. So it's always good to either align yourselves where your weaknesses are and or you might realize I'm better fit for this role instead of the CEO at some point of the business evolution. And maybe it's at that point that it's good to look for a partner to maybe have a partial exit. So that's what's, another one I have is called two bites at the apple, meaning you own your business, you still think there's a lot of growth opportunity, but you want to find a financial partner, a strategic partner, whatever the case may be, to help you grow it faster than you can on your own. So maybe you're going to sell a minority position, maybe a majority, with the idea that, say you sell a majority portion of your business, so say you sell 80%, you keep 20, and then five years from then, when the financial investor goes to get his exit, you'll get a second exit. And a lot of times, that'll, your 20% will be worth more than the 80% you took up front. If you have the right partner, maybe they can help you get to 100 million in sales faster than you could on your own. So it's better to have 20% of a $100 million company than 100% of a $10 million company, if that makes sense. And again, I want this to be interactive. If you have any questions along the way, please raise your hand. Um, and we're happy to take questions. We don't just have to wait till the end. So that's another thing to think about, you know, is the industry opportunity. You know, nothing lasts forever. I mean, even our, the U.S. economy. I mean, there, you know, other countries are catching up to us, and now what's going on in Wall Street? I mean, Wall Street doesn't exist anymore. The traditional Wall Street is evaporated. Who would have thought that? I mean, I never. I mean, I had friends coming out of business school. Their entire net worth is tied up in Lehman or Bear Stearns or you, what have you. And when they get, you know, these investment bankers, they get their bonus checks at the end of the year. A lot of times, as you get more senior, it's not in cash. It's in equity. They pay you in stock, and you're handcuffed, and you can't sell it. So you got all your net worth tied up in this stock that went from 100 bucks down to a penny a share. I mean, it's not it's not a good scenario. But it, it can be similar as a business owner. You put all your sweat, hard hard labor in for 10 years, 15 years. And you now have an asset, and all your net worth's tied up in there. It might make sense to diversify a little bit, take some off the table, even though there's still growth opportunities, and, and get a partner. So that's you know something to consider. You know, market factors. What are the multiples? I mean. In the heyday, right, people were, because the credit was so easy, people were getting monster multiples on their business. When I say multiples, as, as a multiple of your cash flow, or what we term EBITDA in the business. So, you know, sometimes you're getting 10, 15, 15 times. I mean, it's unprecedented. If someone's going to pay you that much money, maybe it makes sense to pay, because no matter how well you do the next 15 years, you're not ever going to get that type of money. So maybe it's the time to take some money off the table. <coughs> Another one, how long do you want to be in it? You have to realize that if a financial buyer <coughs> comes in to buy your business, a lot of times they're making a bet on you just as much as they are on the business. So you've got to realize that you probably aren't going to get 100% out up front. Now, if you're selling 100% of the business, that's one thing. But as a partner, let me say, I'll pay you that amount, but you're going to have to roll up you know, 10 to 50% of the amount you own, meaning I'll cash you out a half, but the other half still stays in the business. And then you'll cash out that other half when I cash my portion out. So if your timeline comes close, you know, I want to be out in two or three years, you might need to start today because it'll probably take two or three years as you roll some of your equity till you're all the way out. So another thing to consider. And then again, diversifying your risk. I mean, for those of you that put all your uh, tuition money in stocks over the last few weeks, you know, you probably have nothing left to pay for tuition next semester. So it's always good to diversify, right? Some bonds, some money market, some... It's always good to diversify. And when you have all your... Net worth tied up in one property, you know, that's always a smart thing to think about. So considerations. Um, do I sell 100% of my business or do I partner with somebody? 100% sales kind of like selling your house, right? Whoever's the highest bidder and they're going to get it to, to a degree. But at the same time, I found a lot of entrepreneurs, they really care who buys their business. I mean, this is your baby. You've grown it. All these people you've hired are dependent on you for their living, and it's kind of like family. 
So you want to make sure you're selling it to somebody who you think will continue to do the strategy that you did, or, or maybe you don't care. Some people don't care, but at the end of the day, it's something to consider. Do I want to have someone come in as a minority partner or, or majority? The moment you sell control your business, you realize that you're not calling the shots anymore. I mean, whoever has 51% at the end of the day, if things aren't performing, you know, you're let go. It's kind of, you know, it's just like sports, the same thing. Fo you know, football team's not winning games. Either the head coach has to go or the offensive coordinator gets fired or the defensive coordinator gets fired. Someone, someone has to, there has to be change. Well, it's no different in business. If things are either performing or they're not. If it's not, there's usually changes. And once you're not in control, you know, you can be, you can be let go. But on the other hand, if it's with a good partner, maybe that, that's the exact right thing to do. So all things to consider. Existing team versus new team, kind of what I talked about just, just a moment ago, whether you're the right person or somebody else, and they can bring in another team that helps you grow up quicker. If you're going to sell or exit, you know, who, who, who's your partner? What's their network? How are they going to help me grow my business? How are, are they going to be a value-added partner, or am I just, I mean, their, their money is just as green as the other guy's money, so if it's just the money, you know, you got to do your homework on who you're taking the money from. I mean, and, and how are they going to help you grow your business and, and, and do your due diligence on them just like they do you? I mean, when I go to invest in a company, I spend, you know, at least three months digging in the business, looking at the financials, talking to customers, looking at the business model, you know, really digging in, checking references on the management team, making sure that I'm backing an A-plus team here where I need to, you know, all those sorts of things. But I find a lot of times business owners and entrepreneurs aren't doing the due diligence back on me, right? I mean... Am I a good person? What, what's my track record? What happens when things don't go so well? How do I behave? How, how have I treated the other CEOs? I mean, you want to know who you're getting in bed with here if you're going to partner with them. Make sure that they align with your you know, integrity or your strategic vision and all those sorts of things. You, you need to do your own due diligence on them. Um, board fees, management fees, closing fees. You know, unfortunately, this is a bad part of my, my industry. Um, thankfully, we're the 1% that doesn't do these sorts of things, but a lot of them do. I mean, they, they're getting rich off, you know, okay, I'll invest in your company, I'll, but, you know, I'm going to charge you a million bucks a year to sit on your board. Um, when you go to sell your company, I'm going to take 1% or 2% of the sales price. When I come in, I'm going to do the same thing, and that all comes off at the top before you see it, you know, anything. So I'd rather, you know, plow all that money back in the business, and we all win together. But unfortunately, 99% of the, you know, industry out there, that's what they do. So you've got to think through those sorts of things. This is one that happens a lot too that's unfortunate, but you know, a lot of times you'll go to sell your business and, and you're only focused on who's going to give me the highest value versus who's going to be the right partner. And a lot of times, so someone gives you, offers you $100 million, the next bidder is 95 The 95 bidder, though, is, turns out to be a very good partner. They're honest up front, and then you have someone else that isn't. And then it comes you know, a week before closing where you are basically already cast your check in your mind and maybe you've already spent it. And they say, well, I said I was going to pay 100, but it's really 85. Oh, it's really 80 million. I mean, they'll change the deal right right before closing. So, so I have termed salami slicing, <clears throat> which can happen, <clears throat> or they might not full, you know, follow through. I'm sure you've read about a high-profile deal here just locally in the Wall Street Journal with Huntsman Corporation, right? They had an offer, like you know, the exact dollar was about 22 range. It was going to be a done deal because that bidder turned around and bought another chemical company. Instead, they got an, an offer from Apollo Group for you know another share, buck, buck fifty share, two bucks a share higher. And, you know they go with that and then they don't close. Now their stock price is at seven, eight bucks, so they've lost a ton of value. They're in the courts, of course, and looking for a breakup fee. But you know they they got in bed with a partner that wasn't upstanding. They didn't fulfill on their commitment. So things you have to think through. Finding the right partner, again, if even it's a lower valuation, at the end of the day, you might be better off. So it's not always about value. Um, again, rolling your equity, I talked a little bit about that, that they require you, and then timing. You know, when's the right time to sell um, based on your industry. So what are different types of exit? As you go to, you know, as you, you start businesses or buy businesses, there's different ways that you can monetize your investment and be able to pull some money out. One is a recapitalization. Although that market is completely shut right now. I mean, the credit markets are actually, you know, completely frozen. But in good times, you know, because a private equity firm that's going to come in and buy your business, a lot of times they don't do it all with equity. They do a portion. So say I'm going to pay $100 million. I may do $50 million in debt on your business and $50 million in equity. But you could take the $50 million out yourself in some cases. So you can go to the banks, bring on some debt, pay yourself out a dividend, diversify, take some money off the table. <coughs> You have buyouts, leverage buyouts. Um, that's what I do. 
again, using leverage and equity to, to buy companies. You have minority investments, which I talked about a little bit. Um, growth capital, that's all 100% equity coming in to help grow your business. So you're not actually taking money out, but you need to get to this position, so you need a lot of more money in to help you grow your business and get there faster before your competitors do. So 100% equity, you have the public markets, although they're completely shut. I mean, there were no IPOs of venture-backed companies last quarter, and I'm certain there won't be this quarter. So I mean, that's all on timing where the market is. You have strategic buyers, which a lot of time will pay more than a financial buyer because they're able to get some synergies beyond just the numbers in your business. And then you have financial buyers, um, similar to what I do. So there's all sorts of ways to, to, to get some liquidity out of your business. Legal issues. I just want to touch on this briefly because I think a lot of times entrepreneurs get so focused on the value that they forget that there's other components to value inside the legal documents that they overlook. For example, liquidation preferences. I remember in the height of the dot-com, after the dot-com crash, people you know, were bragging, well, how much did you get for, you know, I got a 20 million pre-money valuation or 50 million or whatever. But what they didn't realize, yeah, but that came at a high cost. I saw liquidation preferences as high as five and six times. What does that mean? That means if I invested $10 million, I get, 50, I get the first 50 million or 60 million out before you see a penny. And then after that, you get what your ownership is. So your effective valuation wasn't 50 million, it was you know, less than 10 million. So it's not just on the value, you gotta make sure you, know, you have a good attorney, good business advisors, and, and you look at the other parts of the deal on the legal side when you're going to sell your company. You know, liquidation preferences, what's the earnout structure? I've never seen an earnout work. It usually always ends up in litigation. Again, you know, if it were me, I'd want to de-risk the deal and see what it is up front, not worrying how, but sometimes they work too, but at the end of the day, you know, that, what's, what's certain, what's not certain, and how do you value that? What type of instruments coming in? Is it preferred stock? Is it common stock? Is it participating preferred? What sort of coupon? What sort of hurl rates do you, does the money have to hit before you participate? I mean, all these sorts of things you need to factor in in addition to just the valuation. You know, C-Corp versus LLC. As an institution, a, a lot of entrepreneurs, they do S-Corps. Um, it's advantageous from a tax standpoint, but if an institution comes in, you can't invest in an S-Corp. So it has to be converted to an LLC. There's tax implications or a C-Corp, and you need to factor in kind of net attacks, not just gross attacks as well. I mean, one might be a higher valuation, but when you consider in the taxes are higher on this offer versus this one, and think through that. Yeah, question? Better to start with an LLC then with an S-Corp? <coughs> not necessarily. I guess what I'm saying is just consider that if someone's investing that you know you're going to have to convert from an S to an LLC and what the tax implications are on that offer versus another offer. So I'm just saying consider many factors when you go into exit. Don't just consider strictly on the price they're offering you, but the, the, the money in the, comes at a certain structure. And so you want to think net of tax a lot of times. So it's just another thing to think about. But there's a lot of SAS corps. I mean, you can consult with your attorney what's the best for whatever business you're going into, but you know, S-Corps are still wonderful structures. But at the end of the day, the only way you can go pu public, it has to be a C-Corp. So sooner or later, you'll have to convert to a C if public's your exit. So it just depends. Um, you know, control. Are you willing to give up control or not? Is that something you're willing to do, or do you want it to be minority? Someone else calling the shots. Piggyback rights, demand rights, co-sell rights. I mean, these are all sort of legalese terms, and I'm not going to go through all these, but just I want you to think about that there's more to selling your business than just the price offered up front. So as you're raising capital or selling your business, realize that not all capital is the same. There's, there's different types of investors. There's different thoughts. So here I have some of the sources. You know, one's angel investors. These are typically high net worth individuals. They're probably retired, maybe, maybe or not. And they're mostly investing in you. Because a lot of times your plan isn't to a stage, it might be pre-revenue, it might be, you know, whatever, but they're making a bet on you. They trust you, they think you're an A-plus person, they think you're going to be a winner, because the plan, although it sounds good in the rest, it hasn't been proven yet. And those are typically, you know, you can go to the friends and family and angels, seed capital, I mean, those are one sort of type of investors. Then you have senior lenders, of course. Once you have profits and ability to have cash flow or assets, you can leverage that with a bank and get that's cheaper money than to take it from a private equity group like me. It's lower risk, but you know harder to get in the early stages. But that's a way to get some money. Mezzanine debt. So that's usually on top of the senior. It's more expensive than senior. So senior, you're going to maybe pay a single-digit interest rate. Mezzanine, you're probably at 12 to 14 percent interest rate plus warrants. Yeah, well, so, uh, right now. I mean, these guys rule the world right now because <laughs> this is gone. 
Now, that will change tomorrow. And some, what happens, like every cycle, they get too greedy. They want too big of an interest rate. If they'd just be smart and stay in the teens, they would dominate. But instead, they try and get in the 20% range, and then pretty soon, senior lenders take all the business back. I mean, it's, it's a cycle they always go through. But that's another form of financing. Buyout funds like myself, you know, another way a partner come in, give you some liquidity or, or venture capital, earlier stage investors, institutions. And then they're all looking for different things. And like I say, friends and family, value-added capital. I think there's one thing I could say is, again, is doing your homework. I mean, you guys are all students, but everyone's going to do homework on you, on your business, but you always forget to do homework on the other guys. I mean, who's, who, who are you going to partner with? And it's kind of like marriage. I mean, that's why you do dating, right? You get to know different people and make sure is this going to be a good match or not a good match. But you, you want to spend some time and make sure. It's the same thing with, with an equity partner that you're going to bring in. Spend some time with them. Talk to other CEOs in both that have been successful and unsuccessful. I think it's, it's, it's critical. Um, anyway, so that's, that's some different ways to go on raising your capital. Finding the right partner. Again, just to reiterate some of the, uh, the, this main point. Um, Again, life's too short category. I mean, there's some real people, you know, they're whining and dining you, but the moment you sign, right, all of a sudden they're kind of a Jekyll and Hyde thing. They're, they're different people. And, and, and I put in the life's too short category. You don't want to be in business or in bed with people that maybe don't share your values, your ethics, your way of doing business. Because, I mean, I'm not saying anyone's one right, right way and the wrong way, but whatever's your way and the way you like to do it, make sure you're aligned with your partner of how, how, how you do things. Um, Integrity and honor commitments. I mean, this just happened to me a week ago. One of my good friends is CEO of a company. Um, he was in a situation where the equity firm is a group out of Boston. I won't name the name. Um, their investment, because they overpaid back you know, a couple years ago. They, put, they paid way too high of a price. They put a ton of leverage on the company. The company slowed down, so it was underwater. The equity is underwater. The mezzanine debt's underwater. The senior lenders are now in control, calling the shots, and they're going to probably take 50 cents on the dollar. Well, the equity group promised him this big payout based on whatever it sold for, but, you know, it came to the 11th hour, they reneged on their commitment. They didn't honor their commitment, and, you know, he lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, I mean, you just, you know, who, who, who are you going to be with? I mean, you, you want to make sure they're, um, they're upstanding people, because there are some people that aren't. Although that's hard to imagine here at BYU. <laughs> the rest of the world doesn't think the way students at BYU think. Um, what are some things to evaluate? You know, who is your partner? What's experience? How are they going to help you out? Have they done a lot of deals? Or in, uh, how are they going to help you grow your business? Are they trustworthy? Are they respectful to you? Or the creative and agile investment amount. Flexibility around harvest. Sometimes, for example, we sold a company, and the CEO, his request was he wanted to be able to run his business on his own by whoever we exited to and not be someone that was just every day telling him how to do things. That took the right partner because most people would say, oh, I'm going to hire an investment bank and get the highest price possible. In this case, we probably could have gotten more money if we'd gone that route. Instead, we sold to this other company. It was still a fantastic return for us. And we, this CEO, I'm sure the next deal he does or the next two, we're going to be the first phone call. I mean, we, I think we did what was the right thing for him and the business. It was still a good return, but, you know, not everyone's going to be like that. They might sell to whoever, you know, when they're in control, it might not be the person you want to be with as you continue to run the business. So... A lot of things to think through. So any, any questions on that? I'm going to move to valuation for a minute if there are any questions on exit. OK. Great. Well, given that I went to business school at Wharton, I have to bring up some numbers and some formulas. It's just in my, in my DNA. But uh, valuation basics, for those of you who haven't been in finance, uh, at a simplistic level, you have the debt holders. When you have your business, you have any debt. Obviously, the first dollar's out. It's the lowest return to cap, you know, return. But it's, if you're going to sell, they're paid off first because they have, you know, a lien against all your assets, your inventory, your cash, your receivables, etc. And then whatever's left over is the equity and whatever you own. That's the take you take home. Um, another way to look at it in finance, say the net present value of the unlevered cash flows at weighted average cost of capital. One way to value it. Academia likes to say, what's the value of the levered firm? But at the end of the day, what everyone uses, even though it's not the best necessarily, um, is enterprise value or a multiple of EBITDA, which we'll get into here in a minute. So how do they value it? Well, you've learned certainly in your, yes? I have a question about cap rates and how you go about cap rates. Uh, the weighted average cost of capital type or cap rates? Yeah, it depends. Kind of, you know, up to you, but a lot of people don't have 
Well, cap rates usually associated with real estate investments more than what I do. Um, and what I do, we're looking for a certain internal rate of return on our money. And if we don't believe, you know, the five-year projections, we usually take what the management team gives us, and we'll handicap it some because, I mean, management teams are bullish, which they should be, but we found that they don't always necessarily hit their numbers. We'll come with a base case which we think is reasonable with growth rate, margin improvement, all the rest, and, and, and discount it back to say what, you know, to hit the turnover rate of return. We like to get at least 30%. On every deal we do, some will do much better than that. Some will be a zero, but at the end of the day, we want to be in that range. You know, mezzanine debt, you're going to be in the teens, high teens, low twenties. You should be in low teens is the more standard. Bank debt, you're in the single digit rate. Some larger private equity groups that are multi-billion dollars, you know, they're probably in the mid twenties, low twenties return. Well, it'll depend. I'll push you. I'll push you on your assumptions and see how reasonable they are, which I'm going to get to in a moment. I'll talk a little bit about. But sometimes, as long as you can substantiate it, and there's there's things out contracts out there or things that I can get comfortable with. Yeah, I'm not saying I don't agree with everything management says. But from my standpoint, I always do management case, base case, downside case. The downsides, you know, kind of what's happened the last few weeks. We can't get any debt. <laughs> what are we going to do? We got to put more equity in the company because the financial markets are closed. So you know, I got to think through. What if we're in a what if we're in a depression for four years? What if you know? So I do all the scenarios, but at the end of the day, it's a negotiation between the two and getting comfortable with the numbers that you're going to hit, and uh, and it's got to be a win-win. I mean, if the return's not there for for our group, and then you know maybe it doesn't work, and or it may. So it's kind of a give and take. Yeah. Well, private equity is different from, from growing. The, the typical private equity industry would say you raise a pool of money, you return their capital first plus an 8% IRR, compounded internal rate of return, and then the typical fund's an 80-20 split. Uh, ours is 75-25 because we have a, you know, a very strong track record, but that's usually how private equity works. But the nice thing with private equity, it's based on actual liquidations and money coming out. Hedge funds, which I don't know if some of you are going to Wall Street, you know, the hedge fund market, they, they mark whatever they say it's worth at the end of the year, so, which is really silly because it's paper profit. It's not realized, whereas private equity is based on realized, the dollars that actually came out. Then usually there's a management fee on the fund to cover overhead while you're doing the investing. So that's a typical structure. So getting back to any other questions quickly? Okay. So again, academia would say, well, how do you value my business? Well, it's the summation t equals 1 to n of the cash flows and time t divided 1 by the interest rate. Take all those cash flows, discount them back. That's what your company's worth today. Or the Gordon growth model, the cash flow is a one plus the growth rate divided by the interest rate minus the growth. But on Wall Street, this is what everybody in practical uses. It's just simply EBITDA times a multiple. And for those of you who aren't familiar, EBITDA is just simply earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Basically, what's the amount of cash your business throws off every year? And then usually a multiple of that is how they value your business in reality. Different industries get different multiples. If you have a higher growth rate, you're going to get a higher multiple. If you're a bigger company, you're going to get a higher multiple. You always have the benchmark of the public markets. They're trading. People are trading every day. But if you're a private company, it's going to be at a discount to that. And if you're a lot smaller, it's going to be lower. But it gives you an idea of what your company might be worth. So again, discounted cash flow is a method, multiple of EBITDA, um, the VC method. So if you're early stage, the VC method would say, OK, we think you'll sell at this price in five years. We want to get X amount of money to get our return or whatever it is, 30%. We know you're going to go through two or three rounds of financing to get there, and we're going to be diluted in every round, so we need this percentage of your company today. And so they back into it. That's another way VCs do a, a valuation. Um, there's a lot, this is a lot of art more than science a lot of times. Again, you use the metrics and the rest, but at the end of the day, it's a negotiation, and it depends on who's interested in the company, you know, competitive bidding. If you have two groups interested in you and they really, and you like them both and you're equally comfortable with either one and they both, it's kind of like two people bidding on your house, right? I mean, if they're both, whoever wants it more will pay more and so it's all a negotiation at the end of the day. It can be, depending on what situation you're in. Of course, you can use comparisons of competitors, public and private comps, to get an idea of what your company's worth. And then strategic reasons beyond financial reasons. There's always once in a while this outlier where Everyone, the financial buyer will be here at certain returns, and you have some strategic 
but they've got to have this, and they're willing to pay a ton of money for it, well beyond what it's worth. And, you know, that's an outlier. And then if you're in that position, very good for you. <laughs> Hopefully that happens if you're selling 100%. So going back to where you asked the question about assumptions and your management case versus my case. Here's where I see a lot of times where the management team kind of gets tangled a bit as I probe and dig into the model. One, first of all, what's your go-to-market strategy? You better have that nailed. You come in to sit and talk to a group to raise money or to say, I mean, you got to know exactly, especially if you're early stage, how does that work? What is your go-to-market strategy? And have it clearly delineated. Single unit economics. A lot of times at a top level, it makes perfect sense. We're going to make all this money. We're going to grow at X. And then you all of a sudden you back and say, wait a minute. If you really do that, your company is going to represent 1% of the GDP of the United States. Impossible, right? I mean, the only company that's even, I mean, I think Walmart's 3% of the GDP. But they're a monster company. I mean, how, how in the world are you going to be that big? It, it's imp it just doesn't make any sense. If you look at the single economics of the store, I mean, the individual store from the ground up. A lot of people like to do the top down, but you also need to look at the economics from the ground up. Your fixed costs. A lot of people say, okay, they're going to stay constant as we grow and we get over this hurdle. They're never going to ramp. And that's true to a degree, but a lot of times you've got to add people when you grow. And so people miss a lot of times. You're going to have to add more infrastructure and a lot of things as you grow that people don't bake into their models. They, don't, they underestimate. Growth estimates, same thing. Yeah, if every business can grow at 20% a year and 30% margin, of course it's a good investment. It's a phenomenal investment. Everyone loves to own that. But, you know, at the end of the day, how are you going to grow that much more than the GDP growth rate in a mature industry? Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, if you're in a growing industry, yeah, it can. But how long are you going to sustain that? Every industry grows through a phase at some point slows down and it matures and you, you can't have 30% growth rate forever. You know, and benchmarking as well. What are your benchmarks to other businesses and how does your business compare to others? Um, so a few questions as you're going in to talk to venture capital firms that, you know, you're going to be asked, you better be prepared to answer, okay? I call them the seven deadly questions. One, your customer is who? I mean, you better know who your customer is, why they're running by your product or your service or whatever you do that you uh, bring up. Which competitors keep you awake at night? I don't care what industry you're in. Don't be naive to think you're the only one that's ever thought of this idea. That's fine. It's fine that other people thought about it, but how are you going to be different than the others? What are your competitive advantages? How are you going to build that moat around your business that are sustainable competitive advantages? I want to know that. Yes? Well, I think you need to understand, not necessarily surveys, but to know exactly what your service is and who your actual customer is and why are they going to buy it. And obviously, it's, it's helpful if you have contracts and you actually have a few customers, but you're not yet profitable. I mean, there's different stages of any business in their evolution. But when I quiz you or anybody, not just, you know, do you really understand who they are? Or have you just kind of anecdotally talked to, you know, Aunt Mirtha and, and your girlfriend and a few people? I mean, have you done some you know, research on it, talk to other companies in the space, competitors, I mean, do you really understand? Yeah, I mean, it's helpful. If you have surveys, if you have some data on spending patterns, and I mean, there's all sorts of things. It depends on the business, but you really, if you come in and don't really, haven't thought through that, you know, that's not going to come over too well. Growth, how big, how fast? At the end of the day, it's got to be a win-win, right? I I'm, I'm, need to get a return on my money just like you do, and so you got to be able to grow. If there's no growth, you're not going to get a return. Um, Tell me again, you make your money how? <laughs> I, you know, some of these business models are, are, are just crazy. I remember in the dot-com era, which thankfully we didn't do any of those sorts of, sorts of deals, but I've, some of these business plans I'd see, I'm like, I mean, they were comical. I, it just, how, do, how are you going to make, I mean, everyone thought they were going to make money on advertising, right? There's only so much advertising. If you took all the business plans, you know, it would be 10 times the amount of advertising spent annually. I mean, it's just impossible. Uh, so you got to kind of take a 30,000 foot level for a moment and just make sure you, you understand that and that you don't have crazy assumptions. How much money do you need and why? Again, be able to say how much you're going to need at each stage and be able to justify exactly what you need and different benchmarks you're going to hit to get it. So how much do you think your company is worth? Again, valuation, negotiation, and who you all been talking to. You know, we're going to know, you know what other groups are you talking to and, and how, how's that moving along. Um, what do we think internally? So on the other side of the table, what are we thinking? Who are these people? At the end of the day, we invest in people. Yes, question. Go back to the last question. Sure. Okay. So where do you see that gap between like how much money do we need 
need versus how much company is worth. I mean, you won't give us more money than a company is worth, right? So how much you want to give? Well, it, it's it's all a negotiation, right? At the end of the day, and I think as an entrepreneur, there's all the questions you got to think through. You know, at some point you're going to bootstrap your company to a certain stage. You need to decide, okay, if I land a few key contracts, my valuation is going to step up to here. But if I wait too long, I might, my competitors might leapfrog me, and I'm better to take the money and get to the market quickly with the right partner. It's going to help me grow my company much faster than I can on my own. So there's always all these tensions and trade-offs from valuation. But I just, the first part of my presentation was just to say, consider all the factors. Don't just only focus on valuation because the right partner can make it. Again, I, I mentioned this, the one where we bought 80%. Two years later, the 20% is worth more than the 80. I mean, they made a ton of money because we happened, you know, we got the ex-CEO of Toys R Us to be on our board. I helped hire the uh, lady from Stanford who worked at eBay. was fantastic in, in, in this area and growing. We helped bring in new customers. And we grew the business much faster than they could on their own, and that was the right call. And other times, it might not be the right call. So you just, at the end of the day, and there's negotiation and who has leverage, and I mean, but there's benchmarks out there. I mean, the main point is if you can focus on hard data, it's a lot easier to have the discussion than just, I think my company's worth this, but you have no basis to back it up. So just quickly, what am I thinking about? Who are the people? We always focus on people. It's our number one thing. An A team will make a B or C business work, but a B team will totally mess up an A business. It just has been proven over and over, at least in our experience. So. We want to know who you are. You know, we do a lot of due diligence on you, get to know you, check references, people you worked with, both people who work for you and, and above, you know, people you reported to. And it's a lot of times what people don't say as much as what they say. I mean, you know, if someone asks you for a reference and, and you rave about somebody because you just think they're A+, plus, that's what you're going to do. If you say, yeah, they're pretty good or they're good, but you don't say a whole lot, I mean, that's telling me you really don't think this is an A-plus person. So, there's a lot of things we do our due diligence, but we want to make sure we're betting the right people. A plus team, what's their business? What are they selling? What's beyond their control? Can they get there? Can we win together or not? But the four buckets we look at, and this is my final one, and then I'll open up for questions here. We look at four buckets in any investment. Okay, and all four have to work for us to make an investment. One is the management team, that's number one. Again, I've, I've talked to you about that a little bit. The industry opportunity. You can have a great business, but you're in a dying, declining industry market. It's not going to be too attractive. I mean, the industry has to be growing. I mean, all, you know, all um, companies look better when they have tailwind. I mean, you know, when the industry is growing and doing well, it helps cover up. You know, when things start to, you know, kind of like the river, when the water lowers, you see all the rocks. Well, when the water's high, I mean, things look good and the industry is moving. It's a lot easier to compete and win. The business fundamentals. So within the industry, what's different about your company? And, and what are your competitive sustainable competitive advantages? And then deal structure. I mean, all three have to work. If the valuation, it's got to be a win-win. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to want to do a valuation deal, push you so hard that you're, you're not motivated to do everything possible to do the best you can. So a lot of times we align our interests with yours, where the, the better our returns, the more equity you get. So we like to align the interests of everyone. But they all have to work in order to do a deal. So I had some examples, but I'll skip through that so I can leave the last... Ten minutes for uh, any questions you have on this or anything else about business. I'd be happy to answer. Yes. Favorite type. I love business services, and the reason is I don't have to re get my revenue every year. I don't start from zero, right? If I have business services, I have contracts every year. I know I'm going to have a certain amount of recurring revenue that's there every year, and if I get new business, that's great. And I want to grow and do that, but I'm not starting from zero every year. So I love business services, the recurring nature. We've done a lot of those types of deals. Yes? How did you get the initial funding to start your business? How did you get the initial funding? How did you? Well, I came, they had already uh, started. So uh, it was started by an individual named Joe Peterson. It was basically a family office investing his uh, net worth. And Jordan joined him. They both started, who, who you know. And then I joined, they started in 95, and then I joined in 99 after business school. So it was, it was Peterson Family Money. We then developed a track record. We then raised our second fund, our third fund, <coughs> fourth, and now we're on our fifth fund. Um, we have some outside investors, some high net worth individuals. So as you get a track record, just like anything, I mean, if we don't perform, we don't return a good return to our invest. If you, but if you do, it's easy to raise money because we have a track record of performing. Yes? I think there's a lot of opportunity in energy. I think. 
In fact, we have an investment, uh, one you might know here locally, Energy Solutions is one of our companies that we took public last year. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I just don't think, you know, the fossil fuel based, uh, there's going to have to be some sort of nuclear um, like, like they have in Europe. I just don't think we can meet all the demands. And all the green initiatives, which are great, still can't ever produce the amount of demand needed. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in energy. Um, uh, I think healthcare has always went out there. I, we like healthcare services. I think there's a lot of opportunity on that side. Um, so those would be the two I'd say. Yes? You know, I don't, I'm not an expert in it by any means, but if you, if you take a look at whether it's wind or solar or all the rest, the combined, I mean, if they all work perfectly, it's still no way can even come close to meeting the energy demands. So while they're good and they're healthy, and I, and I believe that we should seek those sorts of things, it's not going to solve the problem. Really, nuclear is the only one that can get you there quickly, and I think it's safe and clean. It's just because of the past people have had, you know, they had these accidents and different things, but it's the technology today is completely different what it used to be, you know, versus the Chernobyl accident in Russia that happened before. I mean, that's, it's not like that anymore. I mean, France is almost entirely powered by nuclear. So, but I might be wrong, but I, that's, yes? What did you do right after college? Was your uh, college. So I graduated from here with a master's in accounting. I then worked for Arthur Anderson for uh, three years. The old Arthur Anderson it doesn't exist anymore. At the time, they were one of the public accounting firms. They were actually quite, it was a great firm. It was kind of one of the ones I wanted to go to. And then the Enron scandal basically brought the firm down after I had left. I then went from Arthur Anderson to uh, business school at Wharton. And then from Wharton, I came directly here. I've been here since 99 at Peterson Partners. <clears throat> Do you think the importance of being an A plus Well, I think as you're as you're working with people, uh, it's it's making a difference and prove you know doing so have people to talk to and speak to specific things you've done right. It's, it's I mean obviously it's nice to have I mean you're a good upstanding individual and maybe your ecclesiastical leader might say this guy is a good guy but it's not that as much as you know what have you done what have you performed how did you perform in good times and bad you know when things got tough did you bail on the project or did you find a solution to to, to fix it. Um, as you get more, obviously, when you're younger, you have less of that. But as you do other jobs and things, you'll have people that, you know, you made a difference. You, you did something that, out of the ordinary. You know, it's that sort of thing. Um, talking to people and then getting to know you better. I mean, uh, everyone's at a different stage of their careers. But uh, having a track record and confidence, it's how, you, it's how you communicate. You know, that exudes confidence or doesn't it? Are you, um, how you interact with with the group as you're talking through or going through meetings and as, as you have a curveball, how do you react to that? Or, or you have too big of an ego or are you willing to realize you might not know everything and say, you know, I don't know that. I'm glad you brought it up. I'm going to dig into that and get back to you. I mean, it's hard to put it into one bucket, but there's a lot of different angles that, you know, we look at. Yeah? Um, personally, at, at Peterson Partners, are you kind of good cop or bad cop when it comes to new guys and new investments? It depends on the deal. I mean, how we work it is one partner takes the lead on a particular deal. It's very collegial. Everyone has input, and we have an investment committee meeting, so everyone has to be unanimous consent in order to do a deal. But, uh, yeah, sometimes I'll use my partner as a bad guy, even though it's just me. I'm just saying it's a bad guy. Uh, that's just part of, part of doing it because I have to preserve the relationship. If I'm the lead, I'm never the bad cop because at the end of the day, you're going to be my partner, and you're the guy I'm backing, and I want to have a good relationship with you and have the high trust and the rest, so I'm always going to use somebody else on something like that. Now, if I'm not the lead, then maybe I'm the bad guy for somebody else. So relationships are obviously very important, but that, that happens in a lot of negotiations, certainly. Any other questions in general? Yes? Uh, there's not a lot of easy solutions. Uh, in fact, uh, the individual introduced me and he's left. I mean, he's in a similar type of situation with a 50-50 ownership. If you ever do a 50 in my opinion, partnerships are the absolute best relationship on earth if they go well. I mean, think of marriage, think of, you know, certain partnerships. But they're the absolutely worst if there's no trust and communication breaks down. They can be the absolute worst entity to be in. So if you're ever in a situation, a bad relationship, um, First of all, if your 50-50 partner is always trying to do a buy-sell agreement, what that means is you kind of have this button you can push 
you can get out. Otherwise, if you don't have that, you can be landlocked forever. You always disagree and no one can ever get out. So a buy-sell agreement. Make sure if you ever do a 50-50 partnership or no one has control, have a buy-sell agreement. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's all about how much you value that relationship and what you're willing to I've seen a lot of partners where they pay off a partner much more than they're worth, but just to preserve a relationship. It might be worth, you know, more than they're actually entitled to. Um, but it's kind of a personal decision. There's a lot of ways to do it. But I guess the big one, again, if you're, never, if you're not in control and it's a 50-50, make sure you have a buy-sell. Because otherwise you could be stuck in your business forever. It has a lot of value. You never can get anything out because you, you disagree on everything. And the company doesn't go anywhere. If you're in control, you can always do whatever, you know, you're in control. You can make the decisions. You can force, you know, so. I know it's a bit of a vague answer, but there's so many permutations of that question that it's hard to, it depends on the circumstances, I'd say. Another question back here? I thought I saw any other questions in general. Well, great. I thank you for coming. Hopefully, good luck with you in uh, buying your businesses and growing businesses. <laughs>